good morning, Church of Christ family here at Missouri City. Uh, I'd like to say good morning to uh, each and every one of you and good morning to our visitors who have joined us uh, Facebook live stream this morning. Uh, no, I'm not Brother Michael Williams. I'm Brother Al Collins, and I serve as one of the elders here. And Brother Williams is here this morning, so uh, he's doing preparation. But we do, we do want to welcome you this morning, and we're so thankful to God that uh, he has blessed us this week. Uh, he has given us the opportunity once again to come here and worship him in spirit and truth. And regardless what you went through this week or what you may have gone through, we're thankful to God because uh, he's a mighty good God, regardless of the situation that you may be in. I'd like to go over the order of service this morning. Um, of course, I'm doing the welcoming. And then we'll have an opening prayer by one of our deacons, Brother David Broussard. And then uh, following Brother Broussard, we'll have a couple of songs by uh, Brother Monte Cuba. And then after the songs, we'll have our communion uh, given by, led by Brother uh, Clarence Weston, one of the deacons, and afterwards we'll have the offering by, bro by Brother Joseph Zeno, and then uh, we'll have our sermon by Brother uh, George Michael Williams. And then I'll come back after the, the message and give the invitation, and then our elder, uh, Brother Watson, will do the remarks, and then we'll have a closing prayer uh, by Brother Keith Wright. Uh, that's the order of service, so at this time, we'll have an opening prayer by Brother uh, David Broussard. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in God in heaven, we come with our head bowed and our heart lifted up to thee. Thank you, kind Master, for lying us down last night, touching us with your finger of mercy, allowing us to get up this morning clothed in our right mind, put one foot in front of the other, with a, keeping our mind on Jesus. Help us, Lord, to offer up a worship. Let us make a joyful noise that the whole world will know that Jesus is King, that Jesus is Lord. Lord, we pray for those who are yet um, stricken with the virus. Lord, we ask your kind master to go by the hospital room, go by the homes and touch them, Lord. Heal them, touch them with your healing hand. Bless all those that are watching, Lord, for those that are listening, Lord. We trust, hope, and pray that this service will be an uplifting service. Most of all, you will get the honor and the glory that you deserve. All we say and do, we do it in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' sweet name, do we do it? I'm going to pray. Let us all say amen. amen. i say good morning. And all the time, God is good. If anybody has a reason to sing, oh, we do, oh, we do. If anybody has a reason to sing, oh, we do, oh, we do. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. If anybody has a message to bring, oh, we do. Oh, we do. If anybody has a message to bring, oh, we do. Oh, we do. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh praise the Lord. If anybody has a reason to shout, oh we do. Oh we do. If anybody has a reason to shout, oh we do. Oh we do. Oh praise the Lord. Oh praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Oh praise the Lord. If anybody has a reason to sing, oh we do. Oh we do. If anybody has a 
reason to sing, oh, we do, oh, we do. Let's praise the Lord, praise the Lord. oh, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let's praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Humbled ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Come on and humbled ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And He will lead you up. In the sight of the Lord, come on and humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord, and we will lift you up. Oh, way and we will lift you up. Well, amazing grace. How sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. Oh, that saved a wretch like me. Was a lost, but now I'm fine. Oh, I once was a lost, but now I'm fine. Once was a lost, but now I see. Oh, I once was blind, but now. Ten thousand years. Oh, when we've been there ten thousand years. Oh, when we've been there ten thousand years. Oh, 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 ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord. And He, He will lift you up. Oh. Precious 
scriptural reference, we look to Acts 20 and 7, where the Bible reads, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Also, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 21 through 29, the Bible reads, For I have received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Let us pray for the bread. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for allowing us to meet with you at your table of remembrance. We thank you so much for Jesus, who suffered and died on that cruel cross on our behalf. That he was innocent and he died because we needed a savior. So as we take this bread, dear Lord, let us do so in a proper manner, in a clear understanding of the love that was given on our behalf. It's in Jesus' holy and righteous name we ask this prayer. Amen. After the same manner, also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let's pray for the cup. Dear Heavenly Father, once again we come humbly, thanking you for the cup that represents Jesus' precious shedded blood. We pray that as we take of it, we do so in a proper manner and continue to be devoted to serving you. Thank you so much for Jesus, and it's in Jesus' name we ask this prayer. Amen. At this time, church, you may take the Lord's Supper, the bread, and the juice.
Thank you, Chair. Once again, we have come to another part of this service, which is called the offering. We have biblical scriptures in the book of Luke, chapter 16. I'll be reading from the NIV verse. Scripture reading comes from 10 through 13. The Bible reads, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worthy wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Let us pray for the offering. O oh, gracious Father, we come before thee at this time on behalf of this offering that may be used for the uplift of your kingdom. Dear Lord, we ask that you bless the hearts of those that's giving and those that have the desire to give but not at this time. Thank you, dear Lord, for everything before we ask you for anything. Dear Lord, we cannot say thank you enough because you have truly, truly been good to all of us than we have been to ourselves. Thank you, dear Lord, for life, health, strength, our jobs, and our families. We ask all of this in your magnificent name. We give thanks and praise. Amen. There are three ways to give. Number one is online preferred. The link is on our website. Again, it's online preferred. The link is on our website. Number two is text. You may text the amount to 281-767-8611 and follow the instruction. Again, text the amount to 281-767-8611 and follow the instructions. Number three, mail it to Missouri City Church of Christ, P.O. Box 924, Missouri City, Texas 77459. Again, you may mail it at Missouri City Church of Christ, P.O. Box 924, Missouri City, Texas 77459. Thank you. God bless all. During these times that we're having and <clears throat> people are doing what they want to do, when they want to do it, and they still not considering God as our resource. So we need, still need him to just show us the way. Yes. Don't you know that I'm down here alone? And I need your power, oh Lord, just show me, show me the way, the way, oh Lord, just show me, show me, just show me the way. Show me, show me the way. Me, show me the way, the way. Hey, hey, hey. Don't you know that I'm down here, Lord, and I need your. Just show, show me, show me, just show me the way, cause Lord, I'm your child, oh Lord, oh Lord, I said I'm, I'm your child.
Lord, Lord, oh, oh Lord, sing it I'm your child. Uh-huh. And Lord, I'm dead. And I need it, and I need it. Lord, I need your power. Oh, Lord, I need you to just show me. Show me. Just show me the way. Oh Lord, just show me, just show me, just show, show me, just show me the way. Lord, just show me, just show me, Lord, show, show me, just show me the way. Oh, I'm done. Lord, I need your power. Oh, Lord, just show me, show me, just show me the way. Oh, I'm down, I'm down, I'm down here, Lord, and I need, Lord, I need. I need your power, oh Lord, just show, show me, oh Lord, just show, show me, Lord, I need your grace, Lord, we need your grace, Lord, we need your mercy, just show me. Lord, we need your love. Just show me. Lord, we need your help right now. Right now today. Oh, Lord, show me. Just show me. Show me. Just show me. Lord, show me. Just show me. Show me. Show me. call on Jesus because Jesus is the one who can fix it call on his name every single day his name is always the same Jesus Jesus oh my Jesus Jesus, how I love, how I love to call your name. I'm calling Jesus, Jesus, oh Jesus, Jesus, every day, every day, every day. Oh yes, your name is the Come on, let's call on Jesus. Come on, y'all. Oh Jesus. Oh, how I love, how I love to call your name. I'm calling on Jesus, oh, sweet Jesus, oh, every day now. trouble surround me I didn't have to despair oh Lord you told me that you'd be right there it seems that all my problems all had just begun 
I didn't have to worry no more Cause they were already won That's what I'm calling on Jesus Jesus Oh sweet Jesus Jesus Oh how I love, I love, I love, I love to Hey I'm calling, I'm calling on you Jesus Jesus, oh, sweet Jesus. Jesus, I know that every day, every day, every day your name, your name is the same. Mm -hmm. See, I remember the time when I felt so alone, when I needed you, Jesus. All I needed to do was come, yeah. Sometimes in that morning, sometimes late, late, late at night, when I got down on my knees, I knew that everything would be all right. That's why I call on you, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, how I love. I love to call on you. Oh, I'm calling on Calling on you, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Jesus. Every day, every day. Every day. Your name. Your name is the Come same. on, let's call his name, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. How I love. I'm calling on Jesus. Jesus. Oh, sweet Jesus. Jesus. Every day, every day. Every day. Your, your name. name is the same. Oh, and ooh, ooh. Have you ever lost someone that was so close to you? Death, it hurt you so bad till you didn't know what to do. Oh, you caught on the Savior, tears streaming from your eyes. Oh, and when I needed the Lord, yes, he was right by my side. Said I called him Jesus. Jesus. Oh, my Jesus. Said out of my love, how I love, I love to call your name. Yes, said I called him Jesus, Jesus, oh, my Jesus, Jesus. Said every day, Lord, every day, oh Lord, your name is earth. Yes, said I called him Jesus, Jesus. Always be right there. Oh, it seems like my problems they had just begun. Oh, and when I needed the Lord, yes, they were already one. Said I called him Jesus. Jesus. Oh, my Jesus. Jesus. Said, Oh, Lord, your name is. One more time, I called him. 
name, Jesus. Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We are so grateful to be in the house of the Lord just one more time to lift up his name and praise his name. He is worthy of the praise. And we just thank God for being good to us even when we weren't good to him. We thank God for loving us even when we were hard to love. We thank God for being good to us when we should not have deserved, gotten any of his blessings this past week. But because God is who he is, and because God is love, and because God is a God of grace, and God is a God of mercy, we are here this morning, and we're able to praise his glorious and matchless name on this morning. There is something about the name Jesus, and I'm so glad that I can call on his name. I love calling on the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. And what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I just want to know on this morning, is there anybody that's watching this broadcast this morning that still knows that there is power in the name of Jesus? Amen. I'm so glad that we can call on his name this morning and that when we call on the name of Jesus, things happen. We appreciate those that led us in our service this morning. We appreciate Brother Cuba for leading us in our song service and taking us up uh, to the throne of God. And we appreciate those that led us in our prayers, our communion, uh, offering and those that participated in the worship uh, this is truly all about God and uh, we just thank God for being who he is we're going to continue out of John chapter 8 this morning John chapter 8 John chapter 8 starting at verse number 1 the Bible says, and everyone went to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing Jesus, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it being convicted by their conscience went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. 
He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light, life. Amen. I want to focus on verse 7, 10, and 11, where Jesus says, the Bible says, So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Verse 10, the Bible says, when Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And then verse number 12, Jesus spoke again and said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. This morning we're going to do part two to somebody's got to speak up for the people. Somebody's got to speak up for the people. We're continuing on this subject, dealing with the injustices that are happening in our world. As I said last week, I'll say it again. This perhaps may not be a sermon that will make you comfortable. Thank you. Many may not want to hear this message this morning, but we don't want to watch the news every day hearing about another killing of an African American by police officers that have no business being in their position. And until we get equality in America, until the killings stop, until the profilings stop, until the threats and harassings stop, because you don't fit the profile of who should be in this neighborhood or, or, or who should be in this park or, or who should be in this store or, or who should be in this restaurant until it all stops I have to be honest with you this morning the sermons will not stop it is time for us as ministers in fact it's long overdue to stand up for justice, to stand up for what's right, to preach it from our pulpits, to march with it in the streets, to let it be known to city councilmen and women, to our mayors, to our governors, to our chiefs, uh, and that we will not stand for this type of behavior anymore and the people have a voice through his clergymen and through the people of God. So I say again this Sunday, may not get too many likes and loves on Facebook. We may not get too many amens. Preach preachers, tell it like it is. This sermon may make people uncomfortable. But for too long, we in the church have been stuck in comfort. The place that we know is safe. But I'm learning that those that are comfortable normally tend to go nowhere. Comfort is good sometimes, but comfort can also be deadly because ain't nothing changing. I believe that our comfort has become deadly because we're silent. People are handling business as usual on people of color. It's the norm to target and kill, especially when we can get away with it because nobody is saying anything. But I'm here to tell us that this morning it's time for us to get uncomfortable and speak on these touchy subjects. The fact of the matter is we live in a sick, corrupt, racially divided world and until we tackle these issues change will not come people will continue to do business as usual and will continue to have targets on our backs 
Now is the time for dealing with accountability in the criminal justice system. The issues at hand must be discussed. Jesus tackled the issues at hand in our text this morning. And the issue was here in John chapter 8, there was a woman that was getting unjust, unfair treatment who was facing a death penalty, not necessarily because of her wrong, because she was caught in the act of adultery, but because of who she was and who Jesus was. She was being treated unfairly, not because of her sin. Those men that wanted to condemn her to death could care less of her sin, but they wanted to condemn her because of who she was and because of who Jesus was. Jesus is at this annual Jewish fest, the Feast of Tabernacles. And now I'm not going into all that we went into last Sunday uh, it's on our Facebook and YouTube. Please go back and, and, and look at all of the stuff we covered last Sunday. But I will cover some stuff so you can understand where we are this morning. Jesus is at this annual Jewish fest, which was known as the Feast of Tabernacles. Being that Jesus was who he was, the scribes and Pharisees hated Jesus. To them, he was a radical He's a man that's willing to change things if they were right. He's a man that didn't just go alone to get alone. He broke barriers. He shook things up. He made people uncomfortable. He spoke up for wrongdoings, for injustices, for those who didn't have a voice, for those who were mistreated because of who they were or their skin color. The Jews hated Jesus, and so now they want to trap Jesus because we hate you for what you stand for. They bring this woman in our text caught in the act of adultery in the middle of a crowd of people as Jesus was teaching the people of God. They began quoting the law to Jesus. We dealt with this last week. But this is where I want to continue this morning. They said to Jesus, in verse 4 through 6, after they caught this woman in the act of adultery, after they brought her in the middle of Jesus' Bible class, they said, look, Jesus, I want you to see her because we brought her out exactly how she was. She was just caught in the act of adultery. In other words, she didn't have time, the proper time to put on her clothes. They said, Jesus, we want you to see her just as she is so that you won't be able to dodge the issue. Now, Jesus, here's what we have to say to you. Moses in the law commanded that a woman such as her should be put to death. Now, the question is, Jesus, what do you say? <laughs> All right. They, they, they say, what are you going to do, Jesus? You see her. She's not properly dressed. She was messing with a married woman, a man with her. The law of Moses said she should die. <laughs> what will you do, Jesus? Now, now remember uh, last week, I showed you that these men were no good. And, and they were not really supporting, upholding the law of Moses. They were just being the dirty men that they were. Because they quoted the law to Jesus. But as I told you last week, they had an America mentality. They quoted it, but not all of it. See, last week I showed you that the entire law said in Leviticus chapter 20 and verse number seven and verse number 10, rather, that the man who commits adultery with another man's wife, he who commits adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer, and not the adulterer alone, 
But the law said the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Then the law said in Deuteronomy 22 and verse number 22, if a man is found lying with a woman married to a husband, then both of them shall die. Not just one of them, but both of them shall die. The man that lay with the woman and the woman, so you shall put away the evil from Israel. So the law did not say that the woman only should die. But the law said that both the adulterer and the adulteress should surely die. So I ask again, like I asked last week, if they were really law-abiding citizens, where is the man? The law said that both the adulterer and the adulteress should surely die, but you only quoted it for one. It was a broken system meant to fit a certain type of people. She should die, but he should live. But they committed the same crime. <laughs> oh, how I see we talked about that being lived out even today in 2020. Grace given to one person while punishment is given to another. Justice isn't served for one and the question is how is that right how is it that one suffers and they committed the exact same crime as you did but the other walks free how does one get a slap on the wrist while the other one gets the punishment of death didn't we just commit the same crime? Why didn't you bring him forth as well? And I told you, it's because when you have connections and the laws weren't meant for you, you can easily walk free. Don't worry, we got your back. It's called systemic oppression. You intentionally put me at a disadvantage based on my identity, based on who I am. If I looked one way, the law could be adjusted based on my complexion. In other words, you can change the law depending on the circumstances and depending on who it is. Here in our text, these religious bigots change the law and only made the law for a certain individual. And if she had no voice to speak up for her, their laws would allow people like her to be put to death. But I just love how Jesus responds to their bigotry. Look at verse 5 and 6 of John chapter 8. The Bible says, Now Moses in the law commanded us, that such should be stoned. But what do you say, Jesus? This they said, testing him that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. They thought, now we're about to get into some, some, some tight stuff in, in a few minutes. They thought that by Jesus not responding to them, meant he was trapped. But Jesus said a whole lot by not saying a thing at all. Sometimes silence is more powerful than words. Sometimes, listen to me well, it's good not to respond to ignorance. I've got to say a word right there. We as a people have got to stop responding to ignorance. We've got to stop giving people a reason to target us. When you're being targeted by law enforcement, even if it's unjust targeting, comply then and fight later. In other words, don't give a response then. Just comply and complain.
explain later. Because at least you live to tell the story. We've got to stay out of criminal activity because I must say that I don't condone criminal activity. You commit a crime, but then you think you should walk free. That's not how life works. But here's what I'm saying. I don't believe that every crime committed warrants a death sentence either. But I do believe you must suffer some kind of punishment if you commit a crime. I, I'm not fighting for you to commit a crime, but you walk free. But what I am fighting for is that if you commit a crime, you should be able to at least walk out with your life. That's just a sidebar this morning. But here's my point to the text. Jesus did not respond to their ignorance. He just started writing in the sand. When you respond to people's ignorance, you give them a reason to target you. And my point is, there are just some things that you've got to learn to ignore. People want a response out of you. They want you to act ignorant. They want to find a reason to shoot you, to kill you. They want to find a reason to be justified for putting their knee on your neck. And you've got to learn not to bite the bait. Too many brothers and sisters have died because they bit the bait. The goal is the target is to take them out. And I used to wonder, I used to pull my hair out, trying to figure out why we as African Americans have such a target on our backs. Why is it that my parents had to warn us and stay on our backs so much about not looking suspicious? about dressing a certain way. I used to wonder, why do people want us dead so bad? Why are we such a threat to so many people? So much so that they'd rather kill us. Why does my skin color make you hate me so much? So much so that you'll hunt me down like an animal just for taking a jog in my neighborhood and shoot and kill me like I'm some wild animal. What is the threat? And then I finally figured it out. I finally figured why we as a people have such targets on our backs and it goes all the way back to the Bible. <laughs> the problem is so many Americans have that Pharaoh mentality. Y'all remember Pharaoh? Uh, and I was talking, we were talking about this last Sunday after church. Y'all, y'all remember Pharaoh in, in Exodus chapter 1 prior to Moses rising and becoming this great leader. Pharaoh became concerned and was scared that the Hebrew slaves were growing in number and were growing in power. So in order to maintain their oppression, he put upon them great labor. He put upon the Hebrew slaves cruelty to keep them down. But in his efforts to keep them down, they still rose. <laughs> And they still grew. And so he brought together some midwives and he instructed them that when a Hebrew boy was born, I want you to kill them all. And the midwives did not follow. And the Hebrew slaves continued to grow, the Bible says. Pharaoh had so much hatred in his heart and malice towards the Hebrew slaves that he made a decree. He put out an order that male baby boys, every male baby boy, Hebrew slaves were to be killed by casting them into the Nile River because if we let them live, they'll rise to too much power and they'll take my throne. And so the best way to keep them down and to keep them from rising is to kill them. Oh, I finally figured it out, church. America has become the modern-day Pharaoh. African-Americans 
have risen to places of power. We're enjoying the benefits that so many have enjoyed for many years. African Americans are educating themselves, rising to positions in the world. We made it to the White House with senators, politicians, lawyers, judges, doctors, psychologists, professors, scientists, oncologists, dentists, neurologists, optometrists, pediatricians, teachers, principals, superintendents, mayors, congressmen and congresswomen. We've gotten in the books, gone back to school, enlarged our thinking, obtained associate degrees, bachelor degrees, master degrees, doctoral degrees. We've risen and we're rising. We've moved on up from the east side and we finally got a piece of the pie. All of us don't live in the ghettos anymore, but now some live in the River Oaks and the Montrose areas, Bel Air areas. We've graduated. We've stepped up in life. In other words, we've become more than what so many have seen us as. Thugs, drug addicts, lazy, sorry, trifling, welfare junkies, animals, and therefore... We've become a threat. And I must say this while I'm here, and I contemplated and debated, but I'm going to say it. Because I keep reading this kind of foolishness across my timeline that they're just a bunch of drug heads, thugs, animals, sorry, trifling, lazy. I, I, I see that all the time, every day, somebody has said something crazy about African Americans. But if we as a people were so sorry and so trifling and so lazy and welfare junkies and we're just always waiting on handouts, why in the world were our people used? and picked out as your slaves to do all your work, to pick your cotton, to do your laundry, to clean your houses, to cut your grass, to be your butlers, to be your maids, to watch your children, to clean your children, to iron your clothes, to serve your food, to shine your shoes, and whatever else needed to be done, why choose lazy, sorry, trifling people to do that? I would not want any sorry, trifling, lazy, no good anybody doing anything for me if I know they're not going to get the job done right. It seems like you saw some value, some qualities in us as a people. And you used us in the most simple areas because you knew how strong and powerful we were and we could get a job done right. And you kept books from us. You kept us away from the good schools because if we ever got a book in our hand... <laughs> and educated our mind, we may gain too much power because I see how powerful of a people that you are. You saw, in other words, the value in us as a people. And everybody listening to this this morning, I want to say to you, you've got to see the value in yourself. Don't let anyone tell you who you are and what you can and cannot do. You are more than a thug. You are more than a junkie waiting on a handout. You're waiting on the government to help assist you. You're more than a criminal. You're more than a dope head. You're more than a drug addict. You don't have to resort to violence and stealing and killing to get something in life. You can achieve. You can educate yourself and make it. And I've got a news flash. We have made it. <laughs> and it's because we become more educated and powerful many not all let me say that this doesn't this this doesn't indict a whole race 
this doesn't indict all the police officers because we have some good white brothers and sisters and, and good police officers. But many in America have that Pharaoh mentality and that is kill them because they're rising to power. They have that mentality, don't let God's people go. But I echo, and I want to be on record, I echo what Al Sharpton said the other day in a speech at George Floyd's memorial service. And that is, get your knee off of our necks. We don't want favors. We just want equality. We don't want favors. We just want you to get up off of us. We don't want favors. We just want the same books in predominantly African-American schools that predominantly Caucasian schools receive. We don't want favors. We just want the same curriculum to exist in the hood schools that exist in the rich schools. We don't want favors. We just want the same level of teachers that you put in your top schools to be put in the third wards, the fifth wards, the Cashmere Gardens, the Sunnysides, the Clinton Parks, the Rosa Parks Elementary Schools. We don't want favors. We just want to stop being targets because of our skin color. We don't want favors. We just don't want to be the next victim that the world is marching over, rioting over, protesting over. We don't want favors. We just want the prisons to stop being built for our people because opportunities are limited for us. We don't want favors. We just want clean water in Flint, Michigan. We don't want favors. We just want you to stop putting our children on prescription drugs, talking about they have mental issues or behavioral issues. They don't have any issues. They just need somebody to care for them and to teach them. All I'm saying is we don't want favor. We just want you police officers to treat us with the same respect that you treat all of these mass shooters that kill up masses of people every year but yet they walk out with their lives. We, don't, we want a fair trial as well and not the death sentence. Get your knees off of our necks. We don't want favor, but we want equality. And that's what Jesus' message was all about. It was all about equality. Because watch what he says in verse 7 and 8 of John chapter 8. Watch what the Bible says. So when they continued asking, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. Jesus' message was all about equality. I love that. Jesus said, he who is without sin, let him cast a stone amongst her first. When this woman in our text, who was caught in the very act of adultery, was about to be stoned to death, Jesus didn't pray for her and go back to business as usual. Now, he said something. Jesus says, you don't have to say a thing. I'll be your voice. Here's what Jesus said. He said, yeah, look, 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 I'm a God of equality. Jesus said, okay, we're going to put this in, in, in modern 21st, what's happening right now. This, this is what this text is all about. Here, here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to those scribes and Pharisees, he said, okay, you want to put your knee on her neck. Let's be fair about this thing then. Here's what I'll do. See, because y'all just quoted to me the law of Moses. You said Moses in the law said that a woman such as her should be put to death. He said, all right, I'm a fair God. Here's what I'll do. 
all admit the penalty of the law should be carried out. The law of Moses should be upheld. But it should only be done by those who have committed no sin. In other words, if you want to put your knee on her neck, let me put my knee on your neck as well. <laughs> Jesus said, Jesus said, Here, here's what I'm saying. This woman should not be free from the penalty of the law. But I'm accusing every one of you standing here of having sinned. So therefore, if a knee should be on her neck, every one of y'all get down <laughs> so I could put my knee on your neck as well. <laughs> he said, let's be a people of equality. <laughs> if you wish to judge her and kill her because she messed up, the only way that you should not be judged and killed is that you're pure yourself. You've done everything right. You've never messed up in life before. You've never needed a second chance in your life. You've always dotted every I and crossed every T in your life. You're just perfect. And you've never made a mistake in life. If that be the case, then you have a right to have my knee released from your neck. But then if that's not the case, then I guess everybody needs a knee on their neck because I'm a God of equality. <laughs> I'm not a partial God. I'm not a sexist God. I'm not a racist God. I'm a God of equality. Every one of y'all get down and let me put my knee on your neck. <laughs> he said, let's see your records. <laughs> Show me your records. <laughs> Jesus said, in other words, are y'all sure y'all want to do this? <laughs> y'all sure y'all want to keep your knee on her neck? Because we can do this. <laughs> Jesus was about it. He said, I'm about their life. We can do this right now. But if you do this, just know that the same stones that are thrown at her and in modern times, just know that the same knee that's on her neck will be the same knee that'll be on your neck as well. So Jesus said, go ahead. Show me your records. Throw the stone. You're innocent, right? Throw the stone. And after Jesus said that, see, Jesus, see, they, the, the scribes and Pharisees thought they were G's. Jesus said, I'm going to show you all who the re real G is. <laughs> he said, yeah, throw the stone. And, and while y'all throw the stone, I'll just stoop back down. And I'll start writing again, <laughs> waiting on y'all to throw the stone. <laughs> Jesus said, yeah, I'll show you who the real G is because I know no one qualifies. God showed us right here what equality looks like to the police officers that are doing wrong. I say to you, since you are so big and bad with your suit and badge, pull out your record. Let's see all the things that you never got caught doing. Or perhaps, let's see all the things that you did get caught doing, but just got a slap on the wrist for it. Show us your record. Because if your record ain't clean, I just contend that the same punishment that you give out ought to be the same punishment that you receive. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, show me your record. You're so clean, kill her. Go ahead and kill her if your record is clean. But before you kill her, give me your record first. In other words, what Jesus said was, back, back. 
back back. Get away from me. Get, get away from her uh, unless you're perfect. And, and the woman is standing there waiting on the stone to be thrown. But the first strike never comes because there's no one qualified to have their knee on her neck. <laughs> the first stone never came because somebody spoke up for her. In his mighty act of speaking up, Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Him speaking up saved her life. And in verse 10 and 11, the Bible says that Jesus looks at her and he says, ma'am, where are those accusers of yours? And she says, I have none, Lord. And watch what he says. Jesus says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Jesus says, I'm not here to destroy you, but I'm here to liberate you and to set you free. Jesus said, I'm here to be a voice for you. I'm here to speak up for you. I'm here to represent you. I love that. I, I love that about Jesus. Those that are watching and those that are in this audience this morning, and that's why I chose this text. I, I love this text. Because in this text, Jesus spoke up for the oppressed. In this text, he spoke up for the ones that everyone took advantage of. In this text, Jesus spoke up for the ones that had no voice. In this text, Jesus spoke up for the ones that had no power. Jesus called out the police brutality of his day. He stood with the people and spoke up for the people as one of the people. He didn't just stand with good men like Botham John, but he stood with and died with the criminally corrupt bearing his cross alone with them, receiving a final beating at the hands of the police before his execution. Jesus was a voice for the people. And all I'm saying is that we in the church can no longer pretend that we can follow Christ without following him into the broken places of the world we can no longer pretend that we can follow Christ without paying an exorbitant price at some point we can no longer claim that we follow Christ if we never leave our places of safety and never raise the eye of those who construct and benefit from the systems that impoverish and imprison Jesus said, I'm here to be a voice for you. I'm here to speak up for you. I'm here to represent you and to let you know that there's hope. You no longer have to live in fear. Jesus said to her, in essence, when you don't have a voice and you don't have pull and power, I'll be your voice. And I've come to a point that it's time for us as ministers, as representatives for God, as a representative for his people, as a representative for this community, it's time for me and for all of us to step out. It's time for us to be a voice. It's time for my voice to be heard. It's time for the people to hear from us as a church. I want my voice to be heard loud and clear it's not okay for a dog to get better treatment than a human. It's not okay for a man to be locked up for almost two years for fighting dogs, but men still walk free today from taking a life. <laughs> It's not okay that if you shoot a police dog, you can almost get life in prison. But if a young black man gets shot and killed, they will stand in their ground because they look suspicious and I feared for my life. I'm going to say it's not okay. It's not okay for a black man to lose his life because he was selling untaxed cigarettes. 
It's not okay for a black man to lose his life because of forgery. It's not okay for a black man to lose his life because he was running away from, from us and it looked like his hand gestured towards his pocket and so we killed him. Although he was running away from us, I feared for my life. It's not okay for a young black boy to get killed because he was playing with the toy gun. It's not okay for a black man to be killed because he told me he had a gun that he was licensed to carry and he informed me about it so that he won't get shot. But yet, he still ends up getting shot in his car because I feared for my life. It's not okay for young black men and women to be in the comfort of their homes and apartments. And the police can come in my house and shoot and kill me because I felt like a threat to them in the comfort of my own house. I'm saying it's not okay for that to happen. But boys can go in schools. They can go in churches, go in movie theaters, go in restaurants, go in daycares, go in malls, go in grocery stores, go in airports, go on jobs and kill 15 to 20 people at a time using AK-47s and all kinds of assault rifles, have plans drawn out on their computers, have bombs built, but yet they can walk out with their lives having, having killed all of those people and get pristine treatment. Be served water after killing a group of people because I'm thirsty can get a meal from Burger King by the police because you're hungry after having just shot up an entire church full of parishioners and then sit in a courtroom and plead insanity. But mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers are having to bury their children and siblings because they look suspicious and I feared for my life. They didn't kill anyone. They didn't have a weapon on them. It turned out to be a cell phone, but I feared for my life. But a person can kill 20 folk and they walk with their lives. I'm not okay with that. It's time to step out. Something must be said, church. Something must be done. Justice must prevail. And prevail. And I have to say this, and I'm almost finished. It's going to take more than African Americans, more than African American preachers, more than African American religious leaders to march, to put on summits, to speak out. We've done marches, we've marched the streets crying. Black Lives Matter. We march the streets saying no justice, no peace. We march the streets saying I can't breathe. We march the streets with our hands held up over and over and over again since Selma of 1965 and even years before that, even dating back to Tulsa, Oklahoma, and we're still getting the same results. Change will not happen with just the black community marching now. We're getting laughed at and arrested and made fun of in our marches. What we need now is preachers, leaders, people from other races to be a voice and speak against what's going on. That's how we get heard. Preachers from other ethnicities, you cannot be quiet on this issue. Silence speaks volumes. I know it's not popular. I know it won't get you light, but love for God and for your common man requires that you speak out. Leaders from other ethnicities speak out. Members speak out. We need to create summits with black, white, Asian, Hispanics, Hispanic, all ethnicities where we as leaders are dealing with these racial issues where we are demanding justice to be served, 
We need to sit down with our communities, our local law enforcement, and city councilmen, and governors, mayors, and have these uncomfortable conversations. And I'm here to tell you that I'm willing to do it to help see that it happens if that's what it takes. But what I'm saying is change has to happen now. It's time for us to bear some crosses for the people. Jesus had to bear many crosses to save mankind. Jesus knew that the answer to saving and helping people wasn't just in knowing his identity, titles, and the history of his titles, but it was in taking up the cross. And that's what Jesus calls us to do as people of God. There are real costs to following Jesus, living and loving as Jesus did, speaking out as Jesus did, welcoming as Jesus did. To my brothers and my sisters, my question is, what is your cross this morning? It ought not just be some hardship like dealing with a cranky boss. The cross is the price you pay for living the gospel you confess. It's rooted in the place God calls you to live out your confession. Jesus' cross was a Roman one. It was the empire's death sentence for revolutionaries. My question is, is your faith? revolutionary enough for anyone to notice is your faith visible outside of the walls of this sanctuary Jesus calls us to take up our cross and follow him follow him into the world and in broken places and make a difference and what does it look like to bear your cross here's my invitation on which you might be tortured and killed today it means standing against policies that consign people to death and incarceration, to poverty and exile. It means walking amongst the poor, the hungry, the downtrodden, walking amongst those that are voiceless and giving them a voice. Jesus didn't stay in the safety of the sanctuary. He didn't use scholarship and scholarly debates as a surrogate for doing the work. He spent time in the temple and he studied in the synagogue and then he took it to the streets. He also took some time to himself and did it all over again. Jesus fed the people, food for their bodies and their souls. There are hungry people that are in need this morning. All I'm saying is, we must step out and be a voice for the people. And if we want change to happen, if we want there to be movement, we must also in our current day and time, we as a people must get out and vote. We cry and cry and cry of all of the injustices and things that are not right. And when you ask all people, what well, did you go out and let your voice be heard? Did you go out and do what your forefathers and ancestors died for? And that was to give you a voice through voting. The answer is no. What I'm saying to us is use your voice for change. Vote, vote, vote. Vote for your district attorneys. Vote during the general election. Vote during the primary election. Make a difference. Whether it's a big difference or a little difference, just vote. Any kind of difference is better than nothing. Be heard, but most importantly, get out there and vote. And last but not least, here is the crux of the message. If we want change to happen, the remedy is that we must bring back God in this country, in this world. Real quick, watch what Jesus says. Verses 10, he says, uh, in verse number 10, he says, Where are those women, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. Jesus said to her, Neither do I go and sin no more. And then Jesus spoke to them and said, I am the light of the world. Jesus said, look, the remedy 
to rid all of this racism is that we got to bring God back. We are so messed up as a country, not necessarily because our messages that we preach are messages of peace and love. And those kinds of messages just don't do it anymore. They just don't get people's attention anymore, preaching on love and peace. No, that's not why we're broken. The problem is this country, this world have put out the light. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the light of the world, and we put out the light. They've lost God. We've lost God. It has become wicked and evil because we've removed God, and until we get God back, there will be no peace. And as one preacher prayed, he said, we know your word says, woe to those who call evil good. But that's exactly what we have done. We've lost God in the church. We've lost our spiritual equilibrium and reversed our values. We have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and called it pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and called it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it alternative lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We we have killed our unborn and called it a choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building self-esteem. We have abused power and called it politics. We have embezzled public funds and called it essential expenses. We have institutionalized bribery and called it suites of office. We have coveted our neighbor's possession and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored values of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. We have lost God, and I'm saying that if we want to change, bring back God. <laughs> and in our text this morning, it wasn't until Jesus showed up to this woman wasn't until he showed up for this woman that she had any hope. It was dark for her. It was hopeless for her. But when God showed up, hope showed up as well. Change happened. Movement happened. So much movement happened when Jesus came that he convicted the convictors conscious and it caused them to move so much so that they left, they ran away. The Bible says from the oldest to the youngest got out of there. Jesus made movement happen. He made change happen. God's word and God still has the power. That's all I'm telling us this morning. God's word has enough power to make the top KKK leader of the Klansmen, and his word can make that lion lay down like a lamb. And the top KKK leader, God's word, and God has so much power that he can use that person to be a voice for the people. All I'm saying is that there's sheer power in God. And if we in America can bring God back, all of the mess that we're seeing right now will go away. But until that happens, we'll continue to march, we'll continue to fight, we'll continue to be divided. Jesus showed up for this woman, he spoke up for her, he was hope for her, and he changed things for her. If we want change, we got to be willing to speak up. But when we speak up, we got to show the love of God. We're not speaking up to, to produce hatred. We're not speaking up to have a hate message for another hate message. The message that we're trying to give is a message of love. And until we bring love back in this country, and God is love. Till we bring him back, things will always remain the same. May God bless you. May God keep you. You've heard the message of God this morning. Are you willing to believe this message? Willing to change your ways? 
willing to give your life to Jesus Christ? If so, this invitation is yours. And maybe somebody needs to call in this morning. Maybe you need prayer. And the number to call this morning is 281-261-8944. May God bless you. May God keep you. Hold on just a little while longer. Hold on just a little while longer. Oh, hold on. Oh, just a little while longer. And everything is gonna be all right. Come on and pray on, pray on. Just a little while. Come on and pray on. Say it just a little while. Come on and pray on. Pray on. Just a little while. Don't you know that everything is gonna be. Let's praise on, yeah, praise on, praise on, just a little while. Come on, come on and praise, praise on, just a little while. Come on, come on and praise his name. Praise on, just a I know that everything is gonna be out. Oh, come on and just hold on, hold on, just a little while. Come on and hold on, just, just a little while. Come on and hold. Don't you know that everything is gonna be alright? Don't you know that everything is gonna be alright? Don't you know that everything is gonna be alright? church say amen. amen and if you're watching this morning uh, say a virtual amen uh, I'm happy this morning I don't know about you but I'm happy this morning that uh, brother Williams preached that lesson part two and if you was here last Sunday uh, if you listened last Sunday it was a continuation and uh, I'm just happy this morning that as Christians we can stand and just like uh, Jesus did in uh, John chapter 8, he spoke up. And I think if we're going to affect change, uh, as Christians, we must speak up. We got to speak up on the, the wrong and the injustices in this, in this nation. So, Brother Williams, we thank you for another job well done. Yes, sir. Amen. And if you, if you just know what's going on, if you're aware of what's going on, you know that that lesson was a blessing this morning, and I, we pray that it bless you just like it blessed me this morning. Uh, at this time, we turn our attention to uh, the PowerPoint slides. We have some that are on the sick and shut-in list, so we'll take a few moments to watch those on the board. and we have two that have turned in uh, prayer cards. And I'll read the first one from Sister Diane LaRue. Uh, she writes, thank you 
for all who prayed for my niece and her roommate. They are COVID-19 survivors. Please continue to pray for them as they regain their strength. Hallelujah, Mo City Church of Christ. And then the second uh, prayer request is from Sister Zandra Watson. And she writes, uh, please pray for my aunt who's in the hospital with pneumonia. Also pray, uh, also she had a procedure done on her heart. So we want to keep uh, Sister Watson aunt in prayer. So at this time, uh, let us all go to God in prayer. A heavenly and eternal God, our Father, Again, we approach your throne this morning, so grateful and thankful for all that you've done for us. Uh, we thank you for this day that you've given us and all the blessings within this day. Father, we thank you for just waking us up this morning and allowing us to uh, worship you in spirit and truth. We thank you for the brothers that serve today and those that are watching, uh, not only in this nation, but those that are watching abroad. And Father, we just pray that you continue to bless each and every one of us. And Father, we come thanking you for the message. We thank you for the manservant. And thank you for putting that message on his heart that he can impart it upon us. And Father, we pray that we take this message and that we can be like Jesus, have more compassion for each other in this nation. And Father, that we can have more show quality toward each other in this nation. And Father, we just pray that we let the word dwell in each and every one of us, that we can be better today than we've been in the past. And Father, we just pray for those that turn in prayer cards. Uh, we thank you for the Thanksgiving prayer from Sister LaRue. Uh, we thank you for blessing those that are COVID-19 survivors in their life. We pray that you continue to give them strength. And Father, we pray for Sister Zandra Watson's aunt who's having a procedure. We pray that you be with her and we know that she has pneumonia. So Father, we pray that you touch her in a special way this morning, that you heal her body so that she may gain, regain her health and strength. And then Father, we, we pray for this nation and as we grow weary, we just pray that we all can do good. And we pray that you help us this morning to see our life through having faith in you. And Father, we just pray for our leaders this morning that uh, they realize that this nation is in turmoil. And Father, help them to turn towards you for all their, their, their information and their wisdom. And Father, we know that you created each one of us for a specific reason. So help us to live our life to have, toward having honor and, 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 and glory towards you. And Father, we just pray that you bless us, continue to keep us and protect us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say amen. Amen. Um, I've been given information from Brother Broussard that uh, Brother Taplin will be having surgery on tomorrow, so we want to include him in our prayer request. Um, at this time, just want to say what a message. What a message from uh, Brother Michael. Uh, and I'm looking at a verse, um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11. And it says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as the ability which God give it, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever. Now, I know that scripture is talking about the gospel and rightly dividing the word, but I believe that Brother Michael is telling the truth about what he's preaching and I believe that he's rightly dividing the word of John and also tying it to what's happening to today. So but we just want to continue to uplift and 
be able to lift our preacher up and continue to let God use him uh, in a special way. Uh, I have been looking in the back and typically I'll go back there and see how many people are on uh, our Facebook Live. And we have, from what I understand, someone that is uh, watching from Trinidad. And, uh, and the Bible says, go out into the world. And so for those of you that are in Trinidad, I'm not sure how you got the message, but whoever gave the message to that person in Trinidad, let's all of us send out this stream as live as far as we can because a lot of people are being blessed. So we just wanna say hello to those in Trinidad uh, that are watching today. And then also just a couple of announcements and then I'm going to give way to uh, Brother Michael. He has some important announcements to give us as well about upcoming events. But Adopt a Graduate ends today, uh, June 7th. Thank you, thank you to those who have participated in showing love to our 2020 uh, graduates. And so uh, today is the last day. If you'd like to adopt a graduate, uh, please see Sister Williams. Uh, she will be able to give you that information as well. And then also, baby, congratulations. Congratulations to Jamie and Renee Bamba on the birth of their son, Giannis Arwin, on June the 2nd. So again, congratulations to the Bamba family. I know they're happy for the new addition, and so we will keep them in our prayers as well. Uh, church, we have lots of Zooms going on right now because we can't meet uh, in face. But uh, we have our young adult Zoom from 18 to 40. We have our Kids for Christ, uh, which is from ages four to nine. Uh, and then we have our youth Zoom as well. And then we have our Iron Man Zoom also. And you can see all of these uh, Zooms on our website for the dates and times. And then um, also Sisters Gaining Freedom had a Zoom call a couple of weeks ago. It was led by Sister Shayla. I hear she did an excellent job on the uh, Sisters Gaining Freedom, Freedom Zoom. And uh, they're studying a book that's called uh, Style on the Inside, Suiting and Shaping the Inner to Shimmer and Shine on the Outer. So several Zoom classes going on. Uh, I've received several calls from our marriage couples in reference to when we gonna do a marriage Zoom. Well, we'll have an announcement on that probably next week. We know that you've been quarantined with your spouse and uh, you're having a wonderful time. You don't need no help, you're not arguing. But uh, <laughs> no, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. I'm getting several calls, so uh, just listen for uh, announcements coming up soon. Uh, at this time, want to give way to Brother Michael. Uh, Brother Michael has some announcements uh, that he would like to give you. Thank, uh, thank Brother uh, Watson uh, for the uh, update and uh, just once again thank all of those that have participated in our worship and those that are online that are participating in the worship service and even those that are on the uh, prayer line that are participating and those that we've reached all the way in Trinidad uh, we are just so grateful that you are on uh, and worshiping with us this morning uh, here that there are brothers and sisters in Christ uh, they worship at the Church of Christ there in Trinidad and we're just so glad to uh, have you all with us this morning and all of those that have tuned in to our worship service uh, we praise God for your presence and pray that you were lifted by all that took place uh, in the service this morning. Uh, we want to give just a couple of announcements. I uh, want to remind you that this Wednesday we're going to continue with our virtual revival. And uh, this Wednesday, last Wednesday, we were blessed uh, with Brother Darius Woods, the minister to the Cloverland Church of Christ, uh, did an outstanding job with his message, and we just appreciate him. This Wednesday, we're going to be blessed with Brother David Yasko, the minister from the Westbury Church of Christ. And this 
Wednesday, he will be preaching and dealing with uh, the racial tension and unity, uh, bringing us together, the racial tension that's going on in America and uh, dealing with unity. And then after uh, his sermon presentation, uh, Lord willing, we plan to have dialogue with him and a few others uh, about what's going on in our country. And so uh, we're asking you to please uh, tune in this coming Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, you'll be blessed by the word. And uh, we just thank God for Brother Yasko. Uh, I love Brother Yasko and his spirit and uh, just the relationship that me and him both have uh, as brothers. And for him to be willing to do something like this, uh, we just thank God for him. So please tune in this coming uh, Wednesday. Also, want to remind you that the 21st of this month, uh, that is Father's Day Sunday, and we'll be having our outdoor worship uh, under the tent, and, or you can worship from your vehicle if you're not uh, comfortable uh, coming under the tent. And so that will be the 21st of June uh, this month at 1015. We'll be doing a special Father's Day worship under the tent like we did for our mothers. And so we're inviting the church to come out and please be a part uh, of this great endeavor. Uh, it'll be a blessing being able to see all of our family members, church family again. So uh, once again, June 21st, uh, we will have our Father's Day worship under the tent at 1015 or from your vehicle. Those are the announcements that I have. At this time, we'll have, okay, Brother Zeno will give us a closing prayer, Brother Q will give us a song, and then we'll have Brother Z closing us out. There is a God. There is a God. He is alive. In Him we live. Jesus, we give thanks and praise always. Amen.